Welcome back. When it comes to uh, learning about a museum, it's very important to get people involved in the activities of a uh, museum and all its uh, all information about it. The younger generation and children doesn't have this information about the our museum and our uh, monuments and historical uh, period. And in order to know more about this, we are joined by uh, Mr. Mohammed Hosni, and he's a culture heritage consultant. Hello, sir, and welcome. To our show. Hello. Well, uh, Hello. welcome, doctor. First of all, what's the reason behind that now our uh, youth are no longer interested in visiting museums? For instance, when we were young, we used to go on field trips to visit monuments, to visit museums. But now it seems that it, uh, the, the youth are becoming uh, more and more less interested. So what's the reason behind that? The reason behind that, uh, yeah, Russia, is us. Uh, the children by themselves <coughs> would be very interested in museums if the museums are presented to them in the proper way mm -hmm. and in their own language, the language of today. For instance, when we used to go to museums when we were kids, mm -hmm. it was just artifacts in front of us and we would go move from one artifact to another with a small story about each one. Now these kids are much more interested in mobiles, mm -hmm. in computers, in online applications. We should use the technology of the time to bring the museums closer to our children. And there are many ways of doing that. That would take a whole program by itself to talk about how can we subjugate the technology of the present day <coughs> to make culture and cultural heritage more appealing to our kids and more uh, conducive to imparting the values, the cultural values that we want to impart to our kids. Sir, uh, not only the younger generation now uh, doesn't have information about museum, but also most of the Egyptians, even the, the older generation. Uh, here in Old Cairo, there are, there are many people living uh, around. When they see museums, it's just uh, an apartment or a building that doesn't represent anything to them, They're just an old building. So what happened to uh, the culture of uh, the Egyptians and why they does not, don't appreciate uh, their culture and heritage and the, these historic sites, which is considered uh, internationally uh, important, not only regionally? The simple reason behind that, Yadina, is that our museums have been lately completely detached from their communities. Instead of being part and parcel of the community, they are just an ivory tower over there that people know their whereabouts, but that's it. We are passing in front of the uh, Museum of Islamic Arts, we're passing in front of the Antikhana, we're passing in front of Guy Anderson, but what is it all about? Nobody really cares. Because the museums themselves are not playing the proper role they should be playing in their community. The museum is part and parcel of a community. It has to interact with its community. It has to interact with the people living in this community, not only the younger generation, but the teenagers as well as the grown-ups. And each one of those uh, strata of the society have their own peculiarities and have their own idiosyncrasies, which the museum should cater to and know how to appeal to them and know how to attract them. You know something? The Tate Museum, for instance, in London, has been grumbling as of late because a lot of people go to the Tate Museum as a social gathering place. But that's a plus in my opinion. Yeah. People like the Tate Gallery to the extent that it became a club. It became a meeting point to them. It became a point where they go have lunch, have tea, have coffee, have a break in the middle of the day, and en passant, they would look at the collection of the Tate Gallery. From the frequency of going over and over there, they become in tune to the cultural values and the cultural artifacts that are being displaced, uh, displayed at this place. So the museum has to play the proper role in the community. And as we say, one of the most beautiful definitions, or not definitions, but uh, descriptions of museums 
is that they are oases of stability in times of turmoil. When a society is undergoing a crisis, an economic crisis, a political crisis, a social upheaval, the anchoring element that keeps it deeply rooted to its heritage are the museums. So if the museums play the right role, then they become real anchors. If they don't, they become ivory towers that are absolutely useless and fruitless. Now, Doctor, it's quite uh, interesting what you've said, but I'm quite curious about why do travelers and tourists and foreigners even are more interested in the Egyptian monuments than the Egyptians. And it's still the same monuments and they are still uh, the monuments that uh, do not, we, we don't have the various visual effects or latest technologies, but the, the foreign travelers are interested in it and even we have uh, this, uh, the term Orientalist and Egyptologists and, yes. and so on and so forth. When, and we don't have that uh, as much in here in Egypt. The best answer I will give you mm -hmm. is through a personal experience of mine in one of my last visits to Paris. Mm -hmm. I went to visit the Musée de l'Orangerie, mm -hmm. which is a museum dedicated to Claude Monet and the paintings of, and the art of Claude Monet, and right outside the Louvre. Mm -hmm. I entered the beautiful hall of the Nymphea, which has the water lilies, one of the most important paintings of uh, Claude Monet, and it spans a whole room. It's a 360 degree painting. And I had a technical question, and I wanted an answer to this question. So I looked around for a curator to answer my question. I didn't find the curator. But I found a security officer, a security guard. So I told him, I, I have a technical question. I need somebody to answer me. So he told me very, in a very cool, calm, and collected fashion, try me. So I told him, OK, I have this particular question about Claude Monet. And lo and behold, I found this security guard talking about Claude Monet as if he was living with Claude Monet. He knew more about the art of Claude Monet than any curator that I would have expected to be there. The day our curators are going to be like the security guard of the orangery, then we would be on the right path. I know that what I'm saying is going to antagonize a lot of people, but what I'm trying to say is that France or Paris is not la cité lumière out of nothing, no, because culture and cultural values are deeply rooted and, and, and ingrained in the minds of students and youngsters from the very early age. So that this security guard is very typical of the culture he comes from. He's not an outcast. He's a very typical member of this community that is very culturally imbued with cultural values. You see, this is the problem in Egypt. And unless and until we reach the point where our youth, our teenagers, and our grown-ups are completely imbued and convinced that their cultural values are extremely important to their daily life, we will have a problem. Um, sir, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the international museums everywhere, uh, the, the, the something that really make me sad, um, whenever you go to any museum in any uh, country in the world, uh, for in Berlin, for example, they depend on uh, the Nefertiti's head as their propaganda for their museum. In uh, the United States, in New York, when you go to the Metropolitan, the most important part and section in this museum is the uh, Egyptian uh, section with all they have with the tombs, the, the mummies, and, and even they have temples, uh, uh, great temples there. And they depend on their propaganda about these museums uh, uh, on the uh, yes. Egyptian section. So, and they are, they are really well preserved, unfortunately. Um, what's you the problem? Well, and, and we have here, the, the, the genuine part is here. All they have is the pieces, but we have here the, the, the original. So... You know, Dina, sometimes when I get very excited and very patriotic and say our artifacts should come back to us, the head of Nefertiti should come back, the stone of Champollion should come back, and so on and so forth. And then I looked at myself in the mirror and say, had the head of Nefertiti been in Egypt, would we have done to it one-tenth of what's being done in the Berlin Museum? Had the, stone of, uh, the Champollion stone been in Egypt, would we have catered to it and interpreted and presented it 
to the public. Tenth, the way that the British Museum is doing, this is the problem. I'm not saying that we are not, okay, the, the Tutankhamun collection, for instance, is being well catered to in Egypt. But I'm saying that we have a long way to go when it comes to interpretation. We have a long way to go when it comes to how we present it. You said it yourself. They use the head of Nefertiti as a beacon of, of, of marketing and salesmanship for the Berlin Museum. People go knowing that they will see the, the head of Nefertiti. The programs they make about it, the documentaries they make about it, the films, the lectures, the seminars, that's all part and parcel of rendering your collection live and attractive to people so that people would come with the fixed idea of going to that. Uh, and sir, let me add, uh, every year they make uh, something, uh, a kind of surprise about Nefertiti. This is uh, the way Nefertiti looks like, uh, this is her appearance, this is her features. So they make a huge propaganda and, and they Absolutely. deserve it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you very much. But let me be fair so, so that people don't get a very gloomy picture of what I said. The, the Museum of Islamic Arts, of which I was a consultant at a, per, a certain period of time, had a director named Dr. Ahmad Shuki. What this guy did to the MIA, the Museum of Islamic Art, is, the, is, is equal to what is being done in the best museums of the world. So we have the right people. He is young, he is youthful spirited, he is very imaginative, he has beautiful ideas, he can think like a kid, he talks to his kids and tests his ideas with his kids, and when they work, he comes and brings them over to the museum. We have people like that. But we need a hundred Ahmad Ashokis. We need people like Ahmad Ashoki in all our museums so that we make our museums clubs. Can you imagine, but am I using a, a word like that? Clubs, where students would go very eager to go, not being pushed to go and trying to dodge the, the, the day of the visit of the museum and, and, and come up with any sort of excuses. No, they would be eager to go. Uh, doctor, that would lead us to uh, a, a concept, or uh, we were talking before the interview, and you told me that uh, there are projects for the development of uh, the museums. We, you have uh, introduced, uh, there are th around three or more projects for the idea of uh, museology and studies. and studies, yes. Uh, uh, so would you tell us a bit, how can we develop our museums? How can we alleviate its uh, Okay, standards? okay. The, as I said, our main problem is education. Mm -hmm. We have to educate people. Museology doesn't come uh, as a matter of course. You have to educate people. Mm -hmm. You have to educate people at the level of the schools. You have to educate people at the level of the colleges, universities, undergraduate and postgraduate. I happen to be the first graduate of a program that was the brainchild of a great Egyptian scientist. His name is Dr. Fikri Hassan. He is the Petri Professor of Egyptology in London, in uh, University College in London. Mm -hmm. This man is so patriotic that he left this very coveted position in University College, mm -hmm. came, established a joint program, a master's program, between the Université Française d'Égypte and the Sorbonne, Université Paris 1, uh, Panthéon Sorbonne, whereby they will give a joint program to come up with a graduate who is a specialist in cultural heritage management. Mm -hmm. This was the first time that somebody thinks of producing such a human being. Teenagers, not necessarily teenagers, maybe middle-aged, uh, tour guides and specialists in cultural management who would be professionals, real professionals, scientifically backed professionals in cultural heritage management. Now he has produced five, six, five or six generations of such uh, youngsters. He was copied by the Faculty of Architecture in Cairo University, but they are more interested in the architectural aspects of culture. Uh, and lately, last year, by the University of Helwan, who has a joint program with Germany to produce again master's degree and now PhD students in this area. So there are three programs ongoing now in Egypt 
but the pioneer program is that of Dr. Fikri Hassan at the Université Française d'Egypte with Professor Maria Gravari Barbas in France, in Paris. What is the place or the museum or the uh, or whatever y you mentioned needs more care now or needs more attention? This, but, uh, we need 10 hours to talk about that. But let me give you one, one item that's very important right now. The UNESCO has a list called the World Heritage List. Very important cultural uh, spots in the world are listed on that list. So the Theban necropolis, for instance, in Luxor is listed. The Giza necropolis and so on. We have seven listed sites in the UNESCO World Heritage List. One of them is an intangible site. Cultural heritage is either tangible, things that you can touch, or intangible like a Sir al Hilalia, the epic story of Abu Zaid al Hilali, which was listed as part of the World Heritage List. We have a monastery called Abu Mina in the north coast. It is being swamped with underwater sewage. Underwater is seeping up and demolishing that monastery. We have been given a warning by UNESCO that if we do not do something immediately to redress the situation and save Abu Mina, they will remove Abu Mina from the World Heritage List. Like, like they've moved the Omani Ghazal, they have Al-Maha, the Omani Maha, they removed it from the World Heritage List because they shoot it down. They told them stop shooting it down because it's an endangered species and if we list it on the World Heritage List, it's to protect it. But if you're going to keep hunting it right, left and center, we're going to remove it from the list and they removed it from the list. So what I'm saying is, we have to look at our World Heritage sites, make sure that they are properly managed, make sure that they are properly catered to according to the UNESCO norms. Otherwise, they are going to keep dropping from the list and Egypt, which has more than one third of the World Heritage, as we always claim in Luxor alone, is going to start being one of the poorest countries on the World Heritage list of UNESCO. Doctor, speaking about the World Heritage sites, and you've mentioned how Egypt has around seven of them. Uh, definitely, this is important, and we have one of the major sites is that of uh, Al Muaz al Din Last Street, and it's 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 listed as one site, but it's hundreds of monuments. How do you see that and the importance Bravo, of Islamic Arash. Cairo? Bravo, Arash. You have nailed one of our biggest problems right on, on the head. You find countries like France that would have a slab, one slab, one piece of stone that is listed on the World Heritage List. And we list the entire Theban necropolis as one item on the list. The entire Giza plateau all the way to Saqqara as one item on the list. The entire Islamic Cairo from one end to another as one item on the list. What sort of crazy idea is this? Each stone in this tree can be an item that should be listed on the World Heritage List. And this is a shortcoming on behalf of our Minister of Culture and Minister of uh, Antiquity that should be catered to immediately. Let me give you one other thing that has nothing to do with UNESCO, but to show you that we have things in Egypt that are waning, that are disappearing in front of us, and we are not catering to them as well. The Egyptian Arabian horse. The Egyptian Arabian horse, you tell me what does this have to do with culture? I tell you, well, we have had a culture of breeding Egyptian Arabian horses that are coveted and looked after all over the world. People come from America, from Russia, from China, from everywhere in the world to buy our Egyptian Arabian horses to make sure that their bloodlines are always invigorated. You know what's happening now? We are losing our original bloodline because of a handful of greedy uh, investors who brought over horses from America, from Europe, and are cross-breeding with our Egyptian Arabian, diluting our bloodline, and in a few years, we will not have our original bloodline anymore, and it will be contaminated with all sorts of other bloodlines growing from all over the world. Yeah, we have yeah, to one of the one of the uh, that, the, yeah. the re it's it's a very important issue that must be raised. But 
We, we have to talk one hour. Yes, about, uh, unfortunately. This. It's yes. Very, oh, of course, it's very important. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Hosni, cultural uh, heritage consultant. Thank you very much for joining us today. You're more than welcome. Thank yeah, you very much, Doctor. And now we'll be going uh, to a quick break, but we'll be back for more on Nile Cruise coming to you from the Kritlia House. So stay with us. <laughs>